know, in some senses, as a research scientist, I've always been interested in environmental carcinogenesis. The majority of my scientific career was spent studying the role of ultraviolet light in the causation of skin cancer and the role of immunology in uh, skin cancer production. And of course, ultraviolet light from the sun, and I should add also tanning salons, is our most ubiquitous environmental carcinogen. And of course, skin cancers are their most, uh, the most prevalent of all skin cancers. And so what I was interested in was the question of whether the immune system provided any protection against cancer, because if so, this might be, provide a way to uh, approach cancer therapy. And what I found was that in addition to changing normal skin cells into cancer cells, ultraviolet light alters the immune system in a way that prevents it from attacking skin cancers. Initially, the immune system keeps skin cancers in check, but with continued exposure, that breaks down, and the immune response against skin cancers changes, and it turns itself off, and skin cancers then, then grow unchecked. Now, it turns out that the immune system has many mechanisms for shutting itself down. I mean, you don't want an immune system, an immune response that goes on forever. There have to be many mechanisms for controlling and balancing uh, the immune system. And the um, immune system can turn itself off and uh, turn itself down in a number of different ways. And the latest advance in cancer treatment today actually involves getting rid of some of these suppressive mechanisms and allowing the body's immune system to cure the cancer. And very recently, there have been some quite spectacular increases, um, spectacular successes in using this approach. And this is probably the most popular subject today in cancer treatment. My more significant encounter with environmental carcinogenesis, however, came from my participation in the President's Cancer Panel. And this um, is a panel appointed by the President which is charged with informing the White House with the, on the status of the war on cancer. And each year the panel decides on a different subject to investigate and then it prepares a report on a particular subject. So one year we decided to look at environmental carcinogenesis. And this was a very difficult decision. It took us a long time to decide to do this. I was initially very opposed to doing it. And the reasons were that at the time, it was thought that environmentally associated cancers only represented about 6% of human cancers. And I wondered whether this was something that was really uh, appropriate for the attention of the President's Cancer Panel. And the second issue was that this is a very controversial subject. It is emotionally and political charged. And my concern was that this would divert us from making an objective report on what the situation was uh, in terms of environmental influences. And then there's also a lot of uncertainty in this field. There's contradictory evidence. Some studies say one thing, other studies say another. And I was concerned about what conclusions could we possibly draw from this? And what would be the public message? You know, what, what advice could we give to the public if we studied this subject? On the other hand, um, as was mentioned, this is a subject that had never been studied by the President's Cancer Panel. Uh, it was formed in 1971 as part of the National Cancer Act, and it had never looked at this issue. And of course, there's great public interest in this issue, and it, there is, clearly very little attention that has been paid to environmental carcinogenesis by the cancer research uh, community. The mainstream of cancer research, of course, is focused on cures, not on prevention. So this is an area that is understudied and underfunded. And finally, although this perhaps, you know, could, would only represent 6% of cancers, because of the incidence of cancer today, this still represents 
about 30,000 deaths per year and about 60,000 new cases of cancer per year which might be presented. So with all of these arguments, I was uh, convinced that we should go ahead and I agreed to, to uh, participate. And I have to tell you, this was the most eye-opening experience that I have had in my career. I came into this study with a number of different assumptions, probably ones that we all have. The first assumption is that substances that are regulated uh, would have the regulations enforced. Well, that's not true. <laughs> um, the second assumption is that carcinogens or substances that are declared by the International Agency for Research on Cancer as probable human carcinogens, that these would be regulated. Well, that's not true. <laughs> um, and finally, I was under the uh, mistaken assumption that before things are put on the market in the United States, that they would be tested for toxicity and for their cancer-causing abilities. Well, this is clearly not true. We know that there are at least 80,000 chemicals in our environment, only a handful of which have actually been tested for much of anything. Um, just to give you a little, a few statistics, it's thought that there are about 3,000 chemicals that are produced every year in high volume. That means over a million tons per year. And there are about 1,000 to 1,500 new chemicals each year put on the market, and hardly any of these are tested. So why is this? And the answer is that in our country, we use the reactionary approach to chemical safety. We only regulate substances that have been demonstrated to produce harm. And this contrasts with the precautionary principle, which is used in Europe and Canada and other places, which requires proof of safety prior to release. So in our country, we have no incentives for developing safer alternatives to toxic products. So we finished our report after a year of study, and we wrote in the report that 6% sounded like a serious underestimate to us, and that it was, was likely to be a much larger problem than anyone was willing to admit. Well, this was a really unpopular conclusion. Uh, but if, you th if I think of what my life was like growing up, compared to what it is now, the differences are so striking. For example, when I grew up, we didn't have an exterminator. We didn't have herbicides for the use in the, in the garden. We didn't have Roundup. Um, we had no nonstick pans. There were no styrofoam containers. Um, there, were very, there were no flame retardants. There were very few beauty products. And there were very few household cleaning products. And so one can't help but wonder what is the impact of all of these chemicals on human health? Why have the incidences of, human, of children's cancer and birth defects in children been increasing for the last five decades? Why is it that the onset of puberty has been occurring at a progressively younger age in children? And why is it that the current Epi that in the current epidemic of breast cancer, more than 80% of women have no family history of the disease. Could these be related to the ocean of chemicals in which we now live? Now, with all of these important questions needing to be answered, we have to ask, why isn't environmental carcinogen carcinogenesis a more prominent issue in cancer research? Why aren't people studying this issue? And there are many answers, I think. First of all, it's very difficult to study. You have to be able to measure people's exposure to chemicals over a long period of time, and you have to have a matching control group of people who are unexposed. And so the epidemiological studies are very expensive, and they take a very long time to produce. And, of course, many studies depend on someone's ability to recall what exposures they've had. 
what, how many cigarettes have you, smoked in the, have you smoked in the last 20 years? Or how many glasses of wine have you had in the last six months? I mean, these are notoriously inaccurate ways to measure exposure. So clearly, we need better ways of measuring exposures. And second, it often takes a very long time to see the impact of such studies. Um, think about, uh, there was a study in, done in Australia a number of years ago to try to reduce the epidemic of melanoma skin cancers. And it's known that exposure to sunlight in childhood is a predispose, predisposing condition for the development of melanoma as an adult. And so they did a massive campaign to reduce sunlight exposure in children in Australia. And only now, 20 to 30 years later, are they seeing the result of a decreased incidence. So it takes a really long time to see the outcome. And finally, there's very little federal funding and very little funding from industry to uh, support studies on environmental carcinog carcinogenesis. And of course, most funding for cancer research comes from these two sources. So if we're going to deal with the problem of environmental carcinogenesis, we have to find new innovative ways to screen large numbers of chemicals for their cancer-causing abilities. We need to be able to study mixtures of chemicals, and we need to be able to design studies that will provide answers in, a shorter, in shorter periods of time. And we need to find the funding to do this. And so this actually is why I joined the board of directors for Silent Spring. It is one of only a handful of research organizations that tries to tackle these difficult problems, and it produces highly credible research in this area. And it is also unique that it follows through in applying the results of this research to try to influence public policy to reduce exposure to toxic substances. So I want to end with just a few words about the larger issue of cancer prevention, which is, of course, the ultimate goal of studying environmental carcinogenesis. And this is also an underfunded and underappreciated area of cancer research. But cancer research, because cancer research today is mostly about cures. Now, the gulf between cancer prevention and cancer cures is best characterized by a study often told by the late Judah Folkman, who was a legendary cancer research uh, in Boston and pediatrician. And uh, Judah told the story that um, there was a physician, think medical oncologist, walking along the banks of the Charles River on a Sunday afternoon, enjoying himself. And he hears from upstream somebody saying, help, help, I'm drowning, I'm drowning. And he looks upstream and he sees this person who's in great danger of his life and without a thought, takes his coat off, takes his shoes off, dives into the water and saves this person at some risk to himself. And he's uh, exerting himself terribly and he brings this person out and he's lying on the bank trying to recover from this exertion. And then he hears the second person, help, help, I'm drowning, I'm drowning, I don't know how to swim. And he thinks, oh my goodness, I'm so tired, but I've got to go in and save this person. So again, he dives into the water, he goes and he saves this person, brings them a great threat to his own life, and he's lying on the banks of the river having saved these two people. And as luck would have it, he hears yet a third person saying, help, help, I'm drowning, I'm drowning. And he's too tired to go back into the water, but he sees someone walking toward him up the up river, and it's a cancer scientist, think prevention researcher. And he says, help me, help me. I, I can't go in again. I'm too tired to go and save this person. And the researcher says, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go upstream and see who's throwing them in. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so obviously, both approaches are necessary. Um, it's impossible to prevent all cancers, I really believe that, and we all want better, less toxic treatments for cancer. But reducing the incidence of cancer also needs to be a priority. So preventing cancer has the potential to affect lots, large numbers of people and has the added benefit of sparing people from the 
financial, emotional, and physical consequences of cancer treatment. And now speaking as someone who was cured of cancer by surgery and chemotherapy not long ago, all things considered, I would have preferred prevention. <laughs> so what can we do? We can advocate for more prevention research, which is not an easy task. Cancer treatment deals with people, real people, patients, and survivors. These people have a voice and a face. It's personal. Treating someone with cancer is a partnership with the medical institutions. Curing someone is a personal triumph for both sides. So cures are associated with a very high motivation and a sense of urgency. Prevention, on the other hand, deals with populations, not individuals. It's not personal. We don't know whose cancer was prevented. And it takes a long time to see the results. So there's not the same sense of urgency about something that might happen in the distant future. But it's critically important, and you can help put a face on prevention by advocating for more emphasis on and more funding for cancer prevention research. And you can help Silent Spring and its mission to prevent breast cancer by supporting its research efforts. Thank you very much.